Continuing in our discussion of our continuous random variables, we're going to talk about yet another distribution called the normal. Uh, now, sometimes you'll also hear the normal referred to as like the Gaussian, like a Gaussian distribution. You also hear it called a bell curve. And uh, Gaussian is because it was uh, kind of popularized by Gauss and bell curve is just based upon the shape that it looks like. So if we plot, for example, our probability density function, it looks kind of like this, or you know, shaped something like a bell. Uh, so this is what is known as our normal distribution. Uh, now there's some cool things about it. Uh, the normal distribution is, let's put up some facts about it. It is symmetrical. Uh, so that means that if we fold it, fold it about the center line, it's identical. Uh, it would match up perfectly. And because of that, that means that the mean, the median, and the mode all reside at this center spot. So that's kind of handy about our normal distribution. So it's nice and symmetrical. It extends from negative infinity to positive infinity. All right, so this thing stretches off to both ends indefinitely. And it's fully defined by mu and sigma squared, like our variance. And so sometimes you'll see it written shorthand, um, like in some notation, where it's just this capital N. The capital N represents that it's normally distributed. And then the first number that they put in will be mu. And the second one is going to be sigma squared. Uh, one of the easy ways to tell which one is which is the second one should have, if it has units in it, like uh, if it was really well written, the units are going to be squared as well. So you know that this guy is our variance. And the first one is our mean. Okay, so what we should probably look at is like maybe what is the equation that is going to give us our normal distribution. So the equation that we're looking at for our probability density function looks like this. So it's our f of x again, just like we did with our uniform distribution. And it's this kind of nasty equation. So it's going to be 1 divided by sigma times the square root of 2 times pi. Uh, notice how I didn't use the symbol because we've kind of reserved the symbol of pi for a population um, proportion. And so we're going to want to save that pi or the, the probability of success. We want to save that guy. And we're going to use pi here for um, as written out like this is like the 3.14. Anyhow, pi multiplied by e raised to the negative x minus mu squared divided by 2 times uh, what is it? Sigma squared. Okay, so in all reality, this equation is it's kind of nasty. It's really big, um, but it does define what this shape looks like. Uh, and but really, like if we're going to use this, we'll just use software to actually make uh, the plot, and the software will use this. Now we also know that you know the CDF. Is super handy because the CDF will tell us, uh, you know, at a certain point, what's the probability that we'll, you know, have a result from this point or smaller. And the CDF is useful, but the problem is, is that we really can't solve it. Like, 
we need to take an integral and we can't wind up taking an integral of this so the CDF is I, I, I don't know what the equation is for for the CDF what we actually wind up doing is the computers can use numerical methods to basically approximate what this area is so we're going to rely a lot upon like the, the CDF like what it uh, we're going to rely upon using the CDF um, in the software so that we can calculate out these probabilities uh, traditionally uh, we'd basically use tables like printed out sheets of tables to try to kind of get close to what um, these probabilities are but since we've got software we can be a lot more accurate okay so we don't know exactly what the equation is but we can get these values that would give us the sum of the area under the curve from a certain spot and figure out the area under the curve all the way over. And, uh, and so we'll show that in the, the software, um, in the software videos for like how to actually find those values and how to use them in calculations. Okay, so let's kind of talk about a few more of the truths about our normal distribution, uh, which is kind of handy. So let's suppose we had a mean of 50, and we'll have a standard deviation of 5. Now remember, we know where the standard deviation on a bell curve is, is because it's the distance from the center is right where the inflection point is. Kind of cool little tidbit. So we'd then have one standard deviation away would be at 55, two would be at 60, we could keep on going this way, or we could go one standard deviation below. Let me change our color real quick to, sure, we'll do pink. One standard deviation below, which would take us to 45, and then another standard deviation below would take us to 40. And we can go kind of further and further out. You know, I'll just tick off where three standard deviations are. Well, we can use what are called the empirical rules to just kind of get some idea of what, what the probabilities are. So we know that, that the probability of our random events, so like maybe selecting something from this, but uh, the probability of, we'll say like, x being less than 50, is going to be equal to 0.5. We know it's symmetrical, which means that about this center line, 50% is one way, 50% is the other. Remember, it's the median. Uh, so that's handy to know. Uh, we also know that the proportion of the area under the curve, which also kind of relates to like, if we were to you know, perform this experiment or if we were to like look at this sample, that most of our data kind of happens right in the middle. And in fact, the probability is that 68% of the time, we're kind of landing right in that range of plus or minus, plus or minus one standard deviation. Okay, great, so plus or minus one standard deviation gets us 68. Uh, let's do a couple more of these standard deviations. So we've got this next one, which is approximately 95 is equal to plus or minus two standard deviation. So if we're in plus or minus two, it's like 95% of the time we're landing right there. And then if we kick out all the way to three standard deviations, it's 99.7% at plus or minus three standard deviations, or that, you know, 99. 0.7% of the time, our results are happening within three standard deviations. And things start getting really weird if you get results that are outside of three standard deviations. Now, do they happen? Sure. If you take enough samples, you're going to find kind of these big outliers way on the edges. Uh, but the majority of the time, our results, if they are normally distributed, are coming within basically plus or minus three standard, uh, standard deviations. Okay. So what's cool is that no matter what we have, our mean or our standard deviation, so we had, let me just kind of label this guy, mu was equal to 50, sigma was equal to 5, which made sigma squared equal to 25. 
Uh, the nice thing about all normal distributions is that they can be converted into what is called the standard normal distribution. And the standard normal distribution looks like this. Let's see if we've got a little space down here. So the standard normal is just your kind of regular old distribution. And it's centered at 0. And then one standard deviation away is going to be 1. Two standard deviations away is 2. Same thing over here, negative 1 and negative 2. So we can convert any normal distribution and convert it into what's called the standard normal. And when we do that conversion process, it's called uh, like standardizing. Uh, sometimes we call it like a Z transformation. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a second. And we know a little bit about this from some previous sections as well. But anyways, called standard normal. And it's where the mu equals uh, 0 and sigma equals 1. And you might ask, OK, so like how do I transform uh, you know, some of these measurements? Or you know, like how do I transform an observation into the standard normal? And well, we already know how to do this. We've done it previously. And it's just using our z equation, right? Or using a z distribution. And this is where we take x, our observation, minus mu, and divided by sigma. Basically, what we're trying to do is we're trying to determine, we're trying to transform this x measurement into our standard normal. Figure out how many standard deviations away from the mean are we. So if we make the mean zero and we talk about number of standard deviations, we can kind of transform it into this standard normal. And anyhow, so like transforming it into this standard normal gives us a lot of tools. And when we start using our software, we can in fact figure out like if we were to take this particular point, let's say we're negative you know, 0.5 standard deviations away from the mean, we could ask this question, like, what's the probability of being less than uh, you know, that specific value? We could also use it to figure out what's the probability of being greater than that specific value. Uh, some other things that we could ask is, like, what's the probability uh, of an event being between two values, right? We could ask, like, what's, what's that? And we could also ask, like, if we know what the percent is, could we figure out where the critical point is? So let's say that I know that I'm in the top 80%. So let's kind of go back to this guy. Let's say I know that I'm in the top 80% or that 80% of people are, I don't know, smarter or slower or, you know, whatever. So 80% is like right there-ish, sure. We'll color that in. And we'll say that that's like, you know, 80%. And I want to know this critical point. Can I figure out that critical point? And the nice thing is, is that our software, in fact, uh, can help us uh, figure that out. So, kind of in a nutshell, we've got some kind of names of our normal distribution. Uh, we have some rules for it and how we fully define it. Uh, we have our like empirical rules of like how much of our data is within uh, you know one standard deviation, two standard deviations, and three standard deviations away from the mean. And we know that any normal distribution that we have, any one, can be converted into the standard normal where we're talking about the mean is being zero, and we're talking about observations being a specific number of standard deviations uh, away from the mean. And so with that, it's kind of like our introduction into our normal distribution.